Heavenly Father, as we open your word this morning, open this study, we ask that you grant us the presence of your Holy Spirit, that you would pour your Spirit out upon us in a double measure because of the Sabbath time that we're in, uh, that you would give us words that would edify and strengthen us for this crisis that we already have entered into. Ask a blessing not only on those of us that are in this room uh, with the message that you have for us, but for those that may, might be watching over the internet. Please take control of the, the words that I use. Let them be words that would glorify and honor you. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. These truths are opening up so quickly, I get not uh, quickly, but they're truths that we weren't looking at a week ago. So I don't know how fast they're opening up, but it's hard to estimate out in your mind how long it's going to take you to get through a series. So we're in the middle of a series, believe it or not, about the internal raphia and paneum. This is part six. And I haven't really spoke about raphia and paneum for the movement of the priests for some time, but that is still the logic that I'm working on. But different concepts come up along the way uh, that seem important to address. One of them, of course, is that we're understanding that Nashville, Tennessee is going to get struck by uh, Islam on July 18th, 2020. And I've had people challenging me a little bit about, you know, <laughs> you're saying that Nashville, Tennessee is going to get hit by a nuclear bomb and it, it, that's going to get you in trouble or, or maybe they're saying it's fanatical or whatever they're saying or whatever they're thinking. But So I wanted to start this presentation off by saying not so... Um, Sister White says this, she doesn't say nuclear bomb, but she's the one that identifies Nashville. So, I've never not been willing, since I've had the opportunity to preach publicly, to just use spirit of prophecy and let it say what it wants to say. So we're going to start with that quote here, um, just to remove any question marks about why we're pulling Nashville out of our hats, but we won't get back there for a while. It's your first quote there, her manuscript. 188-1905, kind of makes you think of 1888, right? Uh, when I was, in, was at Nashville, I had been speaking to the people, and in the night season, there was an immense ball of fire that came right from heaven and settled in Nashville. Okay, so sh she's the one that marks Nashville. Now, the way that I have highlighted this quote we're not going to, there's several, not several, there's a few other quotes where she talks about this ball of fire hitting Nashville. And there's certain things that we look at when we go through those. We're not going to do that yet, okay? I'm just putting Nashville in the record that it isn't me that picked Nashville, it was Sister White. But when we go through it, we're going to claim that this is marking the midnight cry, therefore you can see doublings and you can see the, 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 the context of the midnight cry. So if you notice in that... One sentence that I read, I have night underlined in boldface, uh, referring to midnight. Okay, Midnight being part of the story of the parable of the ten virgins. Um, a little bit further on, in that paragraph, it says, the, right, the next sentence, there were flames going out like arrows. Okay, We understand that Islam are the archers of Bible prophecy. Okay, There were flames going, going out like arrows from that ball. Houses were being consumed. Houses were tottering and falling. So whatever that ball was, it sends out a flame that takes down houses and buildings. Okay, in, in, Without any other evidence, it might, it might lead you to think that it was a nuclear blast, but we have lots of other evidence to show that it, was a nuclear, it is a nuclear blast. Um, some of our people were standing there. It is just as we expected, they said. We expected this. Um, you could, uh, I didn't, I missed that, but you see a doubling there. We expected, we expected. You could underline that because a doubling is something that marks a midnight cry. I missed that one. Others were wringing their hands in agony and crying. Okay, the midnight cry. There was a cry at midnight. Unto God for mercy. You knew it, said they. You knew, doubling of you knew, that this was coming and never said a word to warn us. They seemed as though they would almost tear them to pieces to think that they never told them or given them any warning at all. So where I'm starting at here 
is that in terms of the internal raphia and pineum, I've been arguing that the prediction of November 9th is the one that uh, the new movement put all its uh, eggs in that basket with many things that they predicted were going to happen last Sabbath that did not happen. And that that was marking a, a sacrifice for their movement in the context of the story of Elijah. That the prophets of Baal and the priests of the groves go first. Uh, this was their opportunity to give a public demonstration of who and what they were. But we were going to be, do likewise, and ours was going to be July 18th, 2020, which we're beginning to do now. But Elijah lets the prophets of Baal and the priest of Grove do their thing for a while. He mocks them. And then there comes a point in time where he goes and gathers together the, the 12 stones and, and does his offering. So that's the logic I'm using. But the logic that I want you to see here in this first paragraph about Nashville, and in every passage that we're going to show you from Nashville, in every passage, you're going to find there's a theme in there. And if we read the next two paragraphs, I don't think I will because I'm going to save it for the end. The emphasis of these Nashville stories to me more than any other emphasis is the responsibility to give a warning message in advance of an event. In advance of an event. That's what's being described, what we just read in that first paragraph. There's people that are saying, hey, we knew this was going to happen. And then the people that had just watched everything get destroyed said, well, we're lost. Why didn't you warn us? And then as you follow the other paragraphs in these passages, she's, she speaks directly about, in a variety of ways, about our responsibility to give a warning message in advance of an event. Okay, so I'm just putting that in place. And before we get any, into any really prophetic study, I want to build off Sabbath school. It's amazing how often Sabbath schools in this little church speak to what you had planned to do in the sermon in the afternoon. That being the end sign. We were at the point at the end where Toby was defining the end sign. He didn't use the word, but Sister Deborah stated it for him, the end sign. And we have spoken about an end sign more than once recently and for many years, but I want to focus in on a truth about the end sign, and it's that it is this, that it's not simply that because we've overcome sin that we're lifted up as an end sign. When we look at the definitions of it, the end sign she's going to define as a message along with the, the people that have the character of Christ. I'm not saying you separate the truth, but if we're really going to understand the end sign, which is going to draw in the Levites, then we need to understand that part of what draws the Levites in is a specific message. And I'm arguing that this specific message is this understanding about Nashville. So I'm going to go quickly through some really long quotes on end sign and just pull some snippets out, but you'll have the whole quote so you can check me later. The first one's from Acts of the Apostles. Um, First big paragraph, I'll read a couple lines where she's going to emphasize the experience we need to have. What was the strength of those who in the past have suffered persecution for Christ's sake? It was union with God, union with the Holy Spirit, union with Christ. And um, I picked up some notes that Larry printed out, but I want to use the notes that I printed at my house. Since, we, since September 7th, one of the things that we've had to settle, we've been trying to come into unity with people that are coming on board with this message, and one of them was the, the doctrine of the Godhead. Okay, I'm not making a big point here, but she says that the, the unity that's going to come in, uh, those people that have it are going to be in union with God, with the Holy Spirit, and with Christ. seems to me that she understood all three of those entities well. But... Dropping down to the second paragraph, where she's just going to quote from the, the Old Testament. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. I just want you to see there that she's talking about these people, which she's going to define as an ensign in a moment, and they can't be moved. And they're like Mount Zion. And in Isaiah 2 and other places, the glorious holy mountain is the holy mountain. Okay, if she just compared those people with Mount Zion, and in the Bible it's a holy mountain and it can't be moved. So I'm still arguing that the ensign consists of people 
that are perfectly reflecting the character of Christ and cannot be moved. Continuing on, as the mountains are around about Jew Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. He shall redeem their soul from deceit and violence, and precious shall their blood be in his sight. The Lord of hosts shall defend them. The Lord their God shall save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be as, sto as the stones of a crown lifted up as an ensign upon the land. So, that scripture there, God's people, his flock, are going to be lifted up as an ensign. And in the next quote from Thoughts on, from the Mount of Blessing, page 8 says, Of the poor in spirit, Jesus says, Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Their kingdom is not, as Christ hearers had hoped, a temporal and earthly dominion. That's an interesting thought. The kingdom, the, the kingdom of, the, the, of those that are in the ensign is not a temporal, earthly kingdom. It's not a socialistic, political movement. Reading on, Christ was opening to men the spiritual kingdom of His love, His grace, His righteousness. The ensign of the Messiah's reign is distinguished by the likeness of the Son of Man. Okay, if we're going to be the ensign, then we have to be Christ-like. Christ object lessons, probably the most, one of the most fam famous passages about the final warning message, page 415, says, Behold the scripture, behold, says the scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. I'm going to argue that he's going to begin arising tomorrow. Okay. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of His character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, what time? When darkness is wrapping the world, as it is today. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed. Okay, there's a message that gets proclaimed in this darkness. A message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. In the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of His glory, the light of His goodness, mercy, and truth. Now, we're going to read the rest of it. I, I understand this classic passage, as most of you do. And I understand that many, many Adventists use this passage to say that the last warning message given to the world is a message of God's character. And that is His glory. Okay, but I'm not saying that's a surface understanding because it's a correct understanding, but I do want to add in here right, right at this point, his character is to be made known. And what, what commandment is it that lays out his character? The fourth... I thought I might draw you in to that answer. That's not the answer that I'm looking for. Is there any commandment that, that identifies His character specifically? That's identifying His redemptive work and His creative work. So yes, He's the Creator and He's the Redeemer. But is there not a commandment that speaks of His character as being a jealous God, visiting the iniquity unto the third and fourth generation? of those that hate him. His character is, is that he is a jealous God and he will not tolerate evil indefinitely. As the Sabbath school was identifying in the story of Mo Noah, which is the beginning, it's illustrating the end. So his character is also that he is a jealous God. This is the work outlined by the prophet Isaiah in the words, O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah. The, say to the cities of Judah. The same passage about the darkness we're going to look at in a minute, in a minute and she's going to speak about a message going to the Gentiles, but here in this darkness she's speaking about a message going to God's people first, as we understand it, Okay. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold the Lord will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for, for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming, that's us, right? 
are to say to the people, behold, behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of love. The children are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of, words of truth and deeds of holiness. So, I know that some people, all they want to see in that passage is Christ's character and nothing more. But words of truth, um, none of us in this room are, are stupid enough to think that we're not living in an electronic world that... There are powers that be that monitor everything that we put out on the internet. We all know better. Okay, so we should know that the kind of provocative message that we are teaching now that's going out on the internet is probably pretty good justification at some point in time for the powers of be to come and cause some grief upon a ministry like this one way or another. We've seen, it, we've seen that narrative set up in the scriptures. Uh, even before we understood the serious nature of actually saying Islam was going to bring about a nuclear strike and give the day and the place. But what else can you do? Okay, Even in spite of the threat, or, 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 or perceived threat, possible threat, I guess is the way of saying it, what, what else are you going to do? If, you've, if you see it's true, you have no choice, Right? That's the character of Christ. He knew when he came to earth what it was going to cost him. But he couldn't do it otherwise. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not arguing that oh, this means makes us Christ. I'm just saying that the definition of the character of Christ and his glory um, may be quite a bit deeper than Adventists typically define it. Okay? But I'm dealing with the end sign here. I'm saying that this last message of mercy... It's given to a dying, dying world is this ensign, and I'm, I still can't get away from the thus say it, the Lord said, teach me that this ensign will have overcome sin. And we get that from the basic logic from Testimonies, Volume 5 to 16. When the decree goes forth and the stamp is impressed, their character will remain pure and spotless for eternity. This is about the Sunday Law Decree, describing when people get the seal of God, when they get it, their character is set for eternity. But because of fractals, we realize that the Levites and the priests are confronted with this closed-door situation <clears throat> before the Sunday Law that fulfills Revelation 13.11. And the next quote is one that you tie in with that from Bible Training School, December 1st, 1903. This is all familiar ground for all of us. The work of the Holy Spirit is to convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The world can only be warned. So I'm going to put in there instead of world, I'm going to say Levites. The Levites can only be warned by seeing those who believe the truth, by seeing the priests who believe the truth, sanctified through the truth, acting upon high and holy principles, showing in a high, elevated sense the line of demarcation between those who keep the commandments of God and those who trample them under their feet. Now, the, the Levites are going to have the same kind of judgment to pass as the world is in this scenario that's a fractal, okay? Okay. Um, the last part of that passage says, When the test come, it will be clearly shown what the mark of the beast is. It is the keeping of Sunday. And those, those who have, after having heard the truth, continue to regard this day as holy, bear the signature of the man of sin who thought to change times and laws. Okay, so I'm dealing with the, with the end sign. I'm arguing that not only do we have to have our life experience correct with the Lord to be part of the ensign, but that we have to have a message, a specific message, and that the message is part of the logic that we need to understand in this scenario, that the message has a purpose. If you didn't have a message, you wouldn't be the ensign. You have to have a message. Um, this is the one where she's going to once again talk about darkness, only now she's going to talk about calling the Gentiles. The prophet heard the voice of God calling his church to her appointed work. This is our appointed work. Our appointed work is to be the ensign. That the way might be prepared for the ushering in of his everlasting kingdom. The message was unmistakably plain. Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. 
For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to the, thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy coming. I'm going to drop down on a few paragraphs on, the, on this quote, where it says, These prophecies, she quotes several about God's people being lifted up as an ensign, a light. These prophecies of a great spiritual awakening in the time of gross darkness are today meeting fulfillment in the advancing lines of mission stations that are reaching out into the benighted regions of the earth. The groups of missionaries in heathen lands have been likened by the prophet to ensigns set up for the guidance of those who are looking for the light of truth. These connections that we have around planet Earth, though they are scattered and small compared to what they were six months ago, are potentially the end signs that are fulfilling this passage. And then she continues on, In that day, says Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an end sign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek. Uh, next paragraph. The day of deliverance is at hand. The eyes of the Lord run, run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, he sees men and women who are praying for light and knowledge. So there's people in the Levites and people in the Gentile world that are praying right now for light and knowledge. Okay, in the next passage... I'll pass over the first couple paragraphs in the next passage. But it's interesting. It says that if, if you're an ensign worker, you work 24-7. Okay, the first paragraph. Uh, but in the third paragraph, it says, By aggressive warfare, in the midst of opposition, peril, and loss. And the reason I'm reading this is because she's going to give a little war story to identify what an ensign is. And human suffering, the work of soul saving, is to be carried forward. At a certain battle, when one of the regiments of the attacking force was being beaten back by the hordes of the enemy, the ensign in front stood his ground as the troops retreated. The captain shouted at him to bring back the colors. But the reply of the ensign was, bring the men up to the colors. This is the work that devolves upon every faithful standard bearer to bring the men up to the colors. This is an argument of mine about if, if no uncircumcised or unclean are going to pass through the church any longer when people begin to come in, whether it be Levites or 11th hour workers, they're coming to an ensign and the ensign's attitude is, come up to the colors that I represent. If you represent a sin and repent, sin and repent, sin and repent experience, if that's your colors, that's all the higher the Levites and the Nethanims can come up to. Okay, the ensign is an example of, of the colors, of who and what you are. Next page. I, I don't want to spend a great deal of time on the ensign, but I have a reason for spending some time there. Um, it's still in the same, same quote on the top of page 4 in your notes. It says, From all countries the Macedonian cry is sounding, Come over and help us. we got lots of those Macedonian cries going on right now. The problem is, we don't have any bodies to send to help. We used to know people, hither and yon, that we could send to help. But those people are gone. It's... it's Time for the Lord to raise up some new people, okay? But we're getting the Macedonian call. Next paragraph. When the reproach of indolence and slothfulness shall be, have been wiped away from the church, the Spirit of the Lord will, gracious, will be graciously manifested. In this passage, she's talking about part of the reason the work isn't getting done is because we're a bunch of lazy Laodiceans. But she says when we get that Laodicean attitude shaken off, then the Lord will work with us. But I want you to know the people that get worked with here. Notice what she says about them. Divine power will be revealed. The church will see the providential working of the Lord of hosts. I'm, I can't flip this board. I could flip this board over. I won't flip this board over though. The providential leading of the Lord of hosts is the footsteps that you can see in the story of Josiah from the prophet Ezekiel. 
And then the story of Josiah Litch's work in Revelation 9. Then the providential leading of the Lord in the history of Samuel Snow. And those three witnesses, two from the Word of God, one from Millerite history, identifying the providential footsteps in this movement. Okay, those people that are, are, are part of this ensign will see the providential working of the Lord of hosts. The light of truth will shine forth in clear, strong rays, and is an, as in the time of the apostles, many souls will turn from error to truth. The earth will be lighted with the glory of the Lord. Dropping down to the last paragraph. At the same time, there will be a power working from beneath. While God's agents of mercy work through consecrated human beings, Satan sets his agencies in operation, laying under tribute all who will submit to his control. Uh, this was one movement. Now this movement is still here, and there's a new movement, and the leader of the new movement in the recent weeks has said, we're now under new management. Okay? There's a different management team over there than there was always in this movement. Satan sets his agencies in operation, laying under tribute all who will submit to his control. There will be Lord's many and God's many. The cry will be heard. Lo, here is Christ, and lo, there is Christ. The deep plotting of Satan will reveal itself everywhere for the purpose of diverting the attention of men and women from their present duty. There will be signs and wonders, but the eye of faith will discern in all these manifestation harbingers of the grand and awful future and the triumphs that await the people of God. From the satanic agencies doing the, the, their dance of deception, we will recognize harbingers that are telling us where we're at in providential sacred history. Okay, so now I want to expand the definition for us, if we don't already know it, of an ensign. She says, At our camp meetings, the standard is to be raised. The ensign of our faith and practice inscribed, Here are they that keep the commandments and of God and the faith of Jesus. Sister White will just define the ensign as the third angel's message. Those that can meet, keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. But what I'm putting my emphasis on is it's a message. The ensign isn't simply the messengers, it's also the message. So I want you to see another word that she will use as banner. This one here, she says, The ensign of our faith and practice inscribed, Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Dropping to the next quote under the ensign banner. She's going to give the same definition for ensign, but she's going to call it a banner. The last sentence there says, As the fourth commandment, and those who observe it are ignored and despised. The faithful feel that it is the time not to hide their faith, but to exalt the law of Jehovah by unfurling the banner on which is inscribed the message of the third angel, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So the ensign is also the banner. And in the next quote, you can see that Satan has a banner. Our banner is Sabbath. Satan's banner is Sunday. Okay, I'm not going to read it. The next quote is a classic quote about the image of the beast that we use often. It's a little bit f more than we usually quote. I won't quote it. Um, but speaking of the image of the beast test in the last paragraph, she says, This is the test that the people of God must have before they're sealed. All who prove their loyalty to God by observing His law and refuse to accept the spurious Sabbath will rank under the banner the ensign, the banner of the Lord Jehovah, and will receive the seal of the living God. Okay, so the reason I wanted to put the ensign in place is the logic of studying the internal, external of Rafi and Paneum and what our work is in connection with identifying July 18, 2020. It only makes sense to me if we understand that we are the ensign and the ensign has a responsibility to proclaim a specific message in advance. It's a warning message. So on page six of your notes, I have November 9th. Um, and the reason I have November 9th with a few statements underneath it is just to refer us 
to the fact that that we believe in November 9th. We didn't teach that there was going to be an economic collapse on November 9th. That was the new movement. We didn't teach several things that the new movement emphasized. We couldn't we couldn't wrap our mind around it for certain what was going to happen on November 9th. By the time we got there, we, the only thing we could be certain of is a disappointment which we put in place. But in this history here, thank you, um, this was a gift. Stephen started using this since he's been here. And Sister Vicky got the idea of putting a candle or a candle, a handle on this, and it's nice. You can reach all the way across. It's this, this line of history combined with, with Revelation 9 and these repeating patterns. It's 12391 is, is the, what we derive from Ezekiel and his prophecy of Josiah. From Josiah Litch, which connects with the prophecy of Josiah, we see the 391 once again, but what's being marked more than anything else here in connection with it is the 126. Then when we get down to Samuel Snow's letter, we're going to see the 120 and the 391 and the 126 and the 391. But when it comes into our history, these lines identify November 9th. Okay, so I, I'm not, we've been going over this for a few weeks here. I don't intend to recap it. Where I'm at here is saying that from the July 18 studies uh, that are represented on this board, which is available on the web, November 9th is a waymark, no matter what false predictions were made about November 9th by the new movement. Seems to me if November 9th is an important waymark, that there's a logic for Satan to try to throw mud up on that waymark by loading up a bunch of false predictions in order to let the audience that's hearing these things say, hey, it, it didn't happen just to, to throw mud at everything, okay? So I'm saying that we, based upon this, we still understand November 9th as a waymark. Um, the, second, the second line there says, the pilgrims see the glorious land on November 9th. I'm saying the glorious land's probationary time runs exactly with the probationary time of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The story of the glorious land um, is the external, the Adventist church is the internal, and the pilgrims first seen the United States, the land of the United States, wasn't the land of the United States then, on November 9th, 1620. And we firmly believe that Donald Trump, the 45th president of the United States, is the last president of the United States, and he won the election on November 9th, 2016. Okay, so that, that is implanted there for the, the, the beginning of the United States and the end of the United States, you can see November 9th. Um, Stephen Jameson's study on, and I don't know if you have it on this side, maybe you do, on the literal days in the holy place has been presented here more than once. Um... It's not up here. Maybe it's over here. But I'm going to want a board in a minute. And I'm going to use this board, so we'll see. It's not up here, is it? Okay, so, but it's in the public record. What am I doing here? I'm first, pardon me? Yeah, part of it's down here, but that's all right. The first thing I'm doing as we begin this study is reminding us that Future for America, we still accept November 9th as a waymark. And over the past few weeks, we put in the public record several evidences that uphold that waymark. And the one that I'll end with here is midnight on the Berlin Wall. Um, when the Germans, the East Germans, closed the border in England... Uh, before they built the wall, several years before they built the wall, they closed the borders at midnight. I think it was 1957. I could be wrong in the year. But they didn't, they didn't do it in the daytime. At midnight, they closed the borders. Many years later, they built the Berlin Wall. And the Berlin Wall came down at midnight, at November 9th, 1989. 
And on November 9th, 2019, we've been 30 years in this movement exactly because November 9th, 1989 is the beginning of this movement. That's the time of the end. Okay, so that 30 years becomes a subject to consider. So what I'm saying is all those understandings of November 9th are still valid. They still are identifying that as a waymark. All you need is two or three to establish something. We're just setting aside the other nonsense that was hung upon it um, that has fallen apart by the other side. Now, concerning midnight, I'm going to segue in here to midnight. Um, while the bridegroom tarried, July 21st, 1844, this is from Great Controversy 398, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept, and at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go you out to meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. In the summer of 1844, midway between the time when it had, first, when it had been first thought that the 2300 days would end and the autumn of that same year, to which it was afterward found that they extended, the message was proclaimed in the very words of Scripture, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. When we begin to understand how this fits in the prophetic narrative, we came to understand that the, the midway point that Sister White's speaking about here was at Boston. On July 21st, 1844, Samuel Snow first proclaims the midnight cry message. The one we point to that fulfills the midnight cry is the Exeter camp meeting, where he presented it on the 14th and 15th. And on the 15th of August, the midnight cry message, we point to it as arriving in history. But the first time it was presented was in Boston, and that was midnight for that history of April 19th, 1844 to October 22nd, 1844. Once we begin to understand midnight, at some point in time, we came across Ezekiel 1.1, which is in your notes. And there's two things you need to, three things you need to see there, I think. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, the 30th year, November 9th, 1989 to November 9th, 2019, you're in the 30th year. Right on the nose. In the fourth month and the fifth day of the month, July 21st, 1844, which we understand is midnight, which Sister White says was midway, that was on the fourth, in the fourth month, the, on the fifth day of the month. So Ezekiel 1.1 is placing us at July 21st, 1844, it's placing it placing us at midnight, 30 years into our history. But it's in the fourth month and the fifth day of the month. So it's also in the history of the 45th president of the United States, because he's the last president. So in that verse, we, we come to the visions of Ezekiel. Okay, and this is, now I'm at the, the threshold of, of starting to present this presentation. In Ezekiel 1, 1, he's going to have visions of the cherubims. And we've already dealt with this in a, in a recent presentation, so I'm just going to refer to a quote real quickly. Ezekiel 1, 1 goes into verse 2 and says in the fifth, uh, it's in verse 1. I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. Okay, those visions of God are perhaps the most complex and confusing confusing illustration in, in God's Word. And Sister White comments on them more than once. And she says this in Education 177, and, and I, we've read this into the record some time ago, so I've just taken some portions of it. I've ellipsis out quite a bit. The wheels were so complicated in arrangement that at first sight they appeared to be in confusion, but they moved in perfect harmony. We're at the point now since last Sabbath that we're at midnight and now the Lord is going to open up the prophetic message like He's never done before. Ever. He's given us a crash course on prophetic study so that we could see these things over the past few years. But now we can place our fingers upon this passage and know that what He's about to open up to us prophetically it at first view is going to look very complex, but it's going to be in perfect order. Continuing on. <clears throat> 
as the wheel-like complications were under the guidance of the hand beneath the wings of the cherubim, so the complicated play of human events is under divine control. It's about the complicated play of human events. The histories of nations that one after another have occupied their allotted time and place, unconsciously witnessing to the truth of which they themselves know not the meaning, speaks to us. The history which the great I Am has marked out in His Word, uniting link after link in the prophetic chain from eternity in the past to eternity to the, into the future, tells us where we are today in the possession of ages and what may be expected in the time to come. If you use dispensationalism, you just cut your throat on your ability to understand what she just said. She's saying the history that's in the scriptures, the history of the past, uh, history of nations that have come and gone, that are identified in the scriptures, is what tells you what's going to take place here and now. And if you believe those histories were just for then, and nothing to do with now, then you've, you have no anchor. You're a, a ship on a sea, about to hit the rocks. Okay, so... A couple things there. You want to make sure that you do have the correct, sanctified respect for God's Word if you're going to sort out these complicated interplay of human uh, history. But also, at first glance, it's going to see com complicated. So, a point in a period. Let me, now, we're at I, I don't need to. I, th I think if I can do this one. We need one, believe it or not, we, we need one more board. There was a time where we went to a Baptist college in Southern California, a classroom, and did meetings. We were there more than once. And around the walls of the, the room, all the way around were whiteboards. You could just, you could go all day long, okay? Um, what I want you to see here is just briefly is that Ezekiel he's right here this is where Ezekiel as the prophet is right there okay that's Ezekiel 1 1 fifth day of the fourth month and when he's there he's at midnight I'm, I'm arguing with you he's in the 30th year he's at midnight but he's going to get a prophecy he's going to get a vision that for the 390 years that vision goes back before his history. Okay? He's here. Uh, where is he? He's here. But he starts a vision that goes back here to the 390 years, and it goes beyond where he's at. It goes over to here. And he gets two of them. He gets one 40 years that began back here before where he was, and it goes beyond where he was. Okay? So I'm, I'm just wanting to alert us to the idea that a prophet can have a vision be at a certain point in history that we need to mark, and the vision will go into past history and future history. So the Lord's doing some amazing things, and if you don't think that through, I'm not worrying about the dates or the, the time amounts now. I'm just telling you, I want you to see what the prophet Ezekiel's doing here. He's at this point in history, and this vision goes back to here. He lays on his left side, lays on his right side. As a... As a, um, I, w I want you to see, I have a, I've got myself a note here that's making me think. Okay, go to Ezekiel 4, 3 through 8. That's where he's at here. Um, I don't remember what my, oh, okay. That's this. This is his laying on his side for 40 days and 390 days. Enough said. Um, okay. Next, next note. Parallel lines. Revelation 9. Alright, I don't think that Odilio had this up here, what, I, what I'm looking for, but I'll flip and see. Josiah Litch. Yes, maybe he does. This is a tricky one. I don't know how to explain it. In fact, when I, if you see your subtitle, I have parallel lines, question mark. You see that? The reason I have question marks is I don't know how to, I don't know how to define what I'm going to share with you now. I don't know what the word is that would explain it. It's probably a mathematical term if there's one that exists. Okay, but I, got, I have for you the, the, his, the history that backs this up. 
Okay, from right, where's 508? There's 517 years, right here, 908, you see this 908? Um, 908, okay, we have a history here from 1782 to 391, right here. Can you isolate that for you in your mind's eye? And what I'm wanting you to see here is that that history can be this. From, I don't know how to, the word to put on it. Neither do I know how to explain it well, but I'm going to try. All, we're, all I'm doing now is taking this history from 782, that's up here, this 517 years. And this 517 years goes to 1299. Yes, right. I'm asking Stephen and Odilio. That, that, what's throwing me is that it comes down here, but actually... Whoever did it didn't want to destroy the 25th day of the sixth of the fourth month. It's supposed to go like that, from 782 to 1299. This is the history I'm wanting you to look at. Okay? That's 517 years. You with me? Everyone with me? Say amen. amen. Okay. In this history, you can find a way mark in the middle of this history in the year 908. And if you accept that way mark, because it works... What's, what do I mean that it works? I mean that this history here of Revelation 9 is either about Rome or Islam. If you're going to put a way mark up here and you're going to say it's something that happened in South America on that date, it don't work. This is the story about the struggle between Rome and Islam. So any historical date that you're going to use to produce a way mark has to be in the context of that prophecy. You understand me? Okay, so from 782 to 1299, and 1299 is where Josiah Litch is going to begin his prophecy, followed by 150 years, followed by 391 and a half years. But we understand now that there was another 150 years at the beginning of this history that begins back here with, with Abu Bekr. 150 years takes us to 782, and then to July 27, 1299, where Josiah Litch is going to start. You have 517 years, but you have a historical event here in 908, and it's in your notes what it is. And if you put 908 there, then what it does is it produces the same kind of signature that's in the rest of this prophecy. It produces a 126-year period, followed by a 391-year period. Josiah Litch never saw that. But this 126 and this 391, this is the signature of this history. It's the signature of all these lines here. So what am I saying? Here's the difficult thing that is hard to explain. You can also, instead of taking 908 in this history, you can say, eleven seventy three. And you can find the way mark in 1173 that agrees with the theme of Revelation 9 perfectly. You have the history in your notes. And what that does is it produces 126 here and 391 there. What is that? What is it? What's it? Hey, yeah, inversion? What, what, what would you call that? Do you, you realize what I'm saying? Now, you have the histories there to back up my claims. Okay? So, when that kind of phenomenon happens between this way mark and this way mark, and it happens, it can go either way, what is that? Divine. It's divine? But, okay, so what I titled it was parable lines question mark. Parallel lines question mark. You got a name for that, Stephen? Okay, so now, the people that deal with this the Theodores, the Stevens, the Odilio, they don't, they don't say much about this because it's, it's there. It works. It's got to be it's God's signature, but what do you do with it? And I'm saying, 
I want to acknowledge it because it's happening in our history now. And if it can happen back here in this history, the reason it happened back here in this history is to teach us something about our history. And our history, beginning on November 9th and onward, has this same phenomenon going on. And I think we have a responsibility to watch both lines in our history. This line and this line. And I think that's in agreement with the wills within the wills. And that it may seem confusing, confusing at first, but God is going to bring order out of this if we study this closely. Okay, so parallel lines. Um, I think here... Yes, I think a couple places here I could use. I, do, I don't like wrecking Stephen's nice work. But right here, November 9th, to July 18th. Where's July 18th? Right here. You see that? This history here, November 9th to July 18th, I'm saying the same type of phenomenon can be demonstrated here. From the reason that we first put July 18th in the public record is because we've seen there was 252 days between November 9th and July 18th. That had to mean something because 252 is clearly the 2520. You with me now? I'm going to share a... a a prophetic technique that I don't even know what the name is. From November 9th, 11-9, to July 18th, 252 days. When Brother Stephen teaches this, he will show us that if you go 187 days into this, it breaks into 65 days here. But I'm saying you can demonstrate something else. And it's that if you go in the, f the first... Is that how you lay it out when you're emphasizing it? I don't want to... Okay, the first place that... The first time I heard anything about this the first thing I heard was this. From here to here, if you go 72 days, then it creates a 180. 180 meant something to me. Because this 180, it ends right here at Paneum. And over here, at this way mark, um, which I'm just going to put the Sunday law for this, this consideration, it's 180 days. So, this is the first Sunday law. This is the last Sunday law in the United States. So you have 180 days coming to this Sunday law. To see 180 days coming to this Sunday law, that's worth considering. And the reason you know you have 180 days is because this is the sixth hour, and this is the ninth hour, and between the 6th and ninth hour, when you get to the 7th hour, you have one hour. When you get to the 8th hour, you have a second hour. And when you get to the ninth hour, you have the 3rd hour. And there's 60 minutes in an hour. 3 times 60 is 180. So, I thought that was interesting. And I thought it was interesting when you considered Xerxes. Okay, because Xerxes has a feast for 180 days as he's getting ready to go do this battle. But since then... I've came to understand that we have seven days of disappointment 
that's followed by 65 days that takes us to 180. I'm saying the disappointment's over. All right. So the reason that I went over here and made this point and gave you the historical references to see this point if you're willing to see it is in this line, you can see parallel lines that, the, the, that have different way marks in them that still produce God's signature. God's signature being these numbers. These numbers, okay? Are you with me? Now, all I'm doing is giving you the concept before I start trying to defend what these numbers are, what they mean. Okay. Next page. I have three minutes left, huh? All right, let me see. On the, on the, in the center of page 8, let's read from Matthew 20, verses 1 through... I won't go all the way through 9. Stephen's put this in the record here recently. It should be fresh in our minds. It's about the morning, the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the eleventh hour. Read it, read it at your own pleasure. It's already in the public record. It'll save us that amount of time. And the reason that we want to know what this is, this line here is not paralleling that one up there, is I'm going to say the time of the end is the morning that 9-11 was the third hour, that the midnight cry is the sixth hour, and that the Sunday law is both the ninth hour and the eleventh hour. Uh, this is 9-11. This is Paneum. Over here, the ninth hour, we have December 25th, 2021. Okay, so I'd, all I want to do now is just give the basics on why I'm saying morning, third, sixth, ninth, and we'll have that in the record before this afternoon. <clears throat> the pattern of Christ. How many remember the pattern of Christ study? Not very many hands. How about you, Odilia? Okay. All right, in the pattern of Christ... When we did the pattern of Christ, we would show that there was 30 years preparation. Okay? And we would use Christ 30 years from His birth to His baptism when the, the dove comes down. Then He would give His... He'd be empowered at His baptism and He'd give His testimony for three and a half years. And then He was crucified... And then he was laid in the grave, resurrection, resurrected, ascended, and then the second coming of Christ was down here at Patmos. What we would use that for is to show that the pattern of Antichrist has this same 30-year preparation from 508 to 538. And in 538, the papacy was empowered and it gave its satanic testimony for three and a half years until it received the deadly wound and after the deadly wound in 1798, it would be resurrected and ascend to the throne of the earth and be there at the second coming. Okay, And then we would go in, and your notes just notice that we have a Revelation 11, because in Revelation 11, we can show this same pattern. What I'm wanting to show here is this number 30. And what does it represent? Because what it represents, among other things, you go to your notes now, is Christ was hidden for 30 years, and then he comes out in the open. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 2, page 102. The future life of Christ was mapped out before Him. His divine power had been hidden, and He had waited in obscurity and humiliation for 30 years, and was in no haste to act until the proper time should arrive. I want you to see that there's a change in dispensation when Christ is 30 years old. So was there in... in in this history here, 508 to 538, there's a change of dispensation from pagan Rome, paganism, to papal Rome, to Catholicism. 30 years, there's a change of dispensation. Point being is, when we got to November 9th, 
2019, last week, there should be a change of dispensation in this movement. That, that's one of the points, okay? Joseph was 30 years old, okay, when he stands before Pharaoh. Before that time, he'd been a prisoner. He was a prisoner by his brothers in the pit. He was a prisoner in Potiphar's jail, and then he was a prisoner in the prison. But he gets taken out of prison when he's 30 years old, and he stands before Pharaoh, and there's a change of dispensation from a prisoner to the ruler. You see that? David was a fugitive from Saul in the wilderness of En Gedi. But when he was 30 years old, he was made king um, at Paran. Or, at Paran okay? So David, when he's 30 years old, there's a change of dispensation from a, from a fugitive to a king. So when you get to, to the number 30, and that's where Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1 is, right? In the 30th year, which is midnight, in the 45th, the history of the 45th president of the United States, this movement is 30 years old, there's got to be a change in dispensation. Yes? Okay, so, um, where we put, though, where we put in our line, David and Christ, and who else did I, and, and, and Joseph, is right here at 9-11. Okay, this is the baptism, so we put him here at 30 years old, so let's just do a little, little um, basic prophetic work that we do. We have three thirties there, not like Sister Deborah did, no square roots. I'm just going to say, I can take the zero off, can I? A three is a thirty. Yes. So I want us to see that at 9-11, we've got three witnesses with Joseph, Christ, and David of the number three, not counting that this is the empowerment of the third angel's message, or where the first, second, and third angel's message all come together. Okay, so this way mark is number three. You follow me? So on, the, on our regular, typical big line, this is the midnight cry, this is the Sunday law. I'm saying the sixth hour is here, and the ninth hour is here. Ninth hour marking... The end of the Levites, the 11th, the beginning of the 11th hour workers. Okay, 9-11, 9-11, this history is special. But let me see if I can just race through anything else. One other thing, the morning. Go to Revelation 2.28. Almost done with, with carry on in the afternoon, Lord willing. 2.28. The church of Thyatira. There's a promise to the church of Thyatira in verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. And this is the 1260 years of papal rule. And the promise to the church of Thyatira is that they would be given the morning star. Who's the morning star that was given to them? You have it on the bottom of page 8. Great Controversy, page 80. In the 14th century, the morning star of the Reformation arose in England. The morning star of what? So, Sister White's going to go on and tell us what about Wycliffe. This is the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Do we not know that every reform movement parallels every other reform movement? So... There's someone that's raised up at the beginning of the Reform Movement that was the Protestant Reformation, and what's he called? The Morning Star. This is morning. This is morning right here. In the parable of Matthew 20. The time of the end is the morning. 9-11 is the third hour. Paneum, midnight cry, is the sixth hour. The ninth hour is down here at the Sunday Law. And then the 11th hour workers come in and they get the same wages as the people that started at the beginning. Um, okay. Our closing hymn is, I've set us up for the study this afternoon, I hope. Uh, yes, let's pray. Wait, wait, let's not pray yet. Pardon me? Yeah, we're, we're going to have a study this afternoon after lunch, probably about 2.15, 2, 2.15, somewhere in there for those people that are walk, watching online. 
And at that point, we will get into some of this type of history here, Lord willing, um, to identify why, why I said, if you caught it, that I think the Lord's light begins to arise upon us tomorrow. Okay, shall, shall we pray? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we, we thank you for the times in which we're living, that we are still seeing that you are opening your word to us, but these are troublous times, both in the external and the internal. Um, we believe that there are people that are still going to stand up on the right side of these issues. We ask that you continue to speak to them through your Holy Spirit. And as we consider the obligation of giving a warning message, as we've now begun to do, we ask that you give us courage um, that only comes from the opening of your word. We want light from your word that would uh, bring us under more and more conviction as we approach this great struggle. Ask a blessing upon the rest of these hours this day, and we thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.